Hello, and thank you for joining us. Before we begin our discussion, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. My name is Alisa Zanola, and I'm head of events for the Fashion Scholarship Fund. As many of us are very familiar with Zoom at this point, there are some great features that we'd love for you to utilize. There's the chat box, um, so feel free to send comments to the panelists. And there's also the Q&A box. As questions come to mind, we encourage you to submit them and we'll answer as many as possible during the Q&A segment of the session. And now I'd like to introduce our executive director, Peter Arnold. Thank you very much, Elisa. Welcome everybody to the fifth workforce preparedness session of this summer summer scholar series. Um, tonight's session is themed an introduction to machine learning, how Levi's utilizes AI and data. We're grateful to our friend and corporate partner Levi's, especially grateful to Levi's colleague and FSF board member, Heather Roussel. Thanks Heather for arranging this. And I'd like to welcome our three panelists and presenters tonight, Callie Van Brunt, who is an employee experience manager and machine learning practitioner at Levi's. Welcome Callie. Ron Pritapal, who is a design coordinator at Levi's, and Jessica Diaz, who is an operations analyst at Levi's. Welcome Jessica, Ron, and Callie. Jessica, I'm gonna turn this over to you and your very capable hands. Thank you, Peter. Uh, excuse any background noise, I just heard some dogs barking. <laughs> but, uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Before we get into the details of the machine learning bootcamp, we actually wanted to tell you a bit about ourselves, what brought us to this point in our lives and our careers. So next, please. Next slide. Okay, all right. <laughs> So my name is Jessica Diaz. I'm currently an operations analyst in center demand planning at Levi's, as Peter mentioned. I'm a first generation Mexican American, born and raised here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I attended San Diego State University where I earned my bachelor's in international business with an emphasis in marketing and Mandarin Chinese. And I also minored in Spanish. But I'm only fluent in English. Uh, after college, I worked for the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce for a couple of years before I had the opportunity to work at Levi's. Next slide, please, Alyssa. My first job at Levi's was not my first involvement with the company. In fact, Levi's has literally been part of my entire life, even before I was born. My mom, who's featured in the lower left with my sister, uh, started working at Levi's in the late 70s, and she was even pregnant with me uh, while working there, and some people who still work at Levi's knew her before they met me, which is kind of surreal when I actually started working there. Um, many years later, um, my both my sisters also worked at Levi's, and nearly seven years ago, my sister, who's featured in both pictures on the lower left and the lower right, asked if I wanted to join her as a temp. And as I, you can probably guess, I said yes. <laughs> and the temp position turned into a permanent one. I then moved around a bit throughout Levi's for a few years. And then most recently uh, up applied for the machine learning bootcamp, the first ever at Levi's. And as you can see in the upper right, my daughter Willow also wanted to participate. Perhaps she'll continue the Levi's legacy, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, now I'll pass it off to Kelly to tell you a little bit about herself. Awesome, thanks Jessica. So I'm Callie Van Brent and I'm an employee experience manager at Levi's on our talent management team. And similar to Jessica, I wanted to give, begin by giving a little bit of insight into my background. I grew up in a very small town in rural New York and I mean super small as in like we only had one traffic light. <laughs> Um, and then from that small town, I went on to study at Boston University, where I majored in international relations. And while I was attending BU, I also worked in retail at Ralph Lauren Denim and Supply. From there, after graduation, I started working at the TJX companies, and I allocated home product for TJ Maxx, such as the candles that you'll see up here on the screen. And from there, I finally joined LS and Co, doing similar work, but instead with our outlet women's products. 
And after about a year and a half in that role, I felt I had a really good grasp on the work, but didn't necessarily see myself doing it long term. And at the same time, I noticed a yearning for career development in my peers. And so I sought out an opportunity that would allow me to stay with this company that I really love while helping my peers to grow their careers. And this is the point that I joined our human resources team. And I've held many roles on that team since then, including our, being our intern program manager, uh, doing talent analytics, and then now, as you know, I'm an employee experience manager. So that's a lot of background information. I'm sure that you're wondering why I chose to tell you all of that. Um, but the reason really is that to hopefully show you that your path is not always straight and that it's okay for you to pivot if you find that your passions lie elsewhere. I also wanted to showcase that the foundational skills that I needed in order to participate in the machine learning bootcamp were picked up along this path, not in any singular role, but in all of these roles that I've held. And now with my newly acquired machine learning skill set, I'll be practicing people analytics and I'll be looking into aspects of our employee population, like our composition in regards to gender, race, and ethnicity. I'll also be working on projects like predicting our seasonal hiring for retail stores and I'm even forecasting employee, employee attrition. I'm super grateful for the skill set and I'm really excited to see what impact I'll be able to have on LS and Co. And here I just wanted to highlight some photos from my time at Levi's um, from the Pride Parade to our community day. These are memories and events that I think represent the values of the company and the reasons that I'm really proud to work here. And with that, I will pass it back to Jessica to dive into our use case from our bootcamp. Thank you, Callie. So just to give a little context about what the bootcamp was, timing and everything. Um, so we, there were 365 applicants. This was the first time it was ever done at Levi's, kind of also new for the apparel industry as well. Um, 43 people of the 360 or so made it into the boot camp, which was an eight week course, very demanding. Um, you're at the computer eight to nine hours a day. If you went away for just a few minutes, you would have been lost when you came back because it moved so fast. I remember there were times where somebody was trying to talk to me. I'm like, I can't, <laughs> I'm gonna miss this. I can't right now. Um, so it was definitely a privilege. And at times for me, especially, cause I, I had a little one-year-old running around a little difficult to, to focus, but it, it was an amazing experience. Um, next slide, please. So for our use case, we were doing some uh, merchandise financial plan forecast modeling. Next. And just to kind of give you an overview of what mer merchandise financial plan is and the strategy. Um, it's a strategy and planning used to kick off each go-to-market cycle, and it's a long-range forecasting exercise that's completed over 18 months to help guide in design, development, and supply chain activities that follow. Next. And each season, the MFP, for short, forecast guides uh, strategy discussions by outlining which categories are expected to grow, maintain or decline, analyzing the profitability expectations of business segments, including, if you can go back, Alyssa, um, sorry, I'm <laughs> just on the second section down there, analyzing the profitability expectations of each business segment, supporting and designing teams with a framework of how many products should be designed and at which price points. And so we're gonna focus on, well, we had three groups within the LSA beginner track. And for the rest of this presentation, we'll focus on our Asia region, but we did look at other regions as well. It's just, it's a lot of information to go through. So we're just gonna focus with Asia for now. And next please, I have to fix this, hold on. So um, the reason we wanted to tackle this use case was because the tape the approach today is very manual and bound to our limited human level insights. It's 
difficult to obtain all the data in the first place. And the analysis that's currently used is at a very high level at um, the consumer and category level. And we can't really dive deep and understand where what everything is coming from. So often forecasts are just guided by intuition and just knowledge about the business. So now we know that we can actually use more advanced techniques to deliver the forecast and improve our ac accuracy that we couldn't do in the manual methods that we had used in the past. And I'm losing my thumb. So these better forecasts allow us to prepare the supply chain, react to trends more quickly, and ultimately make more money, maximize revenue and profit. So on the next slide, you can see that we applied our data science and machine learning techniques to this problem of MFP. And as you can see here, it's really a scientific process. We begin with the hypothesis, move through model testing, go through feature selection, feature tuning, evaluation, and then all around and around and around. Keep going through until you find the model that, that uh, fits your needs. And for us, as I mentioned, we were looking at Asia and we specifically dove into China because for Levi's that's a hot region to be looking at. If you go into next. And there were several models that we used to, to test uh, all within Python um, a time series as well as tree-based models called Facebook Profit Model, CatBoost, and XGBoost. And the training period was to 2016 through 2018, and we were trying to predict 2019. And we optimized the model accuracy by adding in some other parameters and features. And then finally, we wanted to evaluate to see how accurate our prediction was by comparing actual 2019 and our forecasted 2019 units. Uh, next. So we use the profit time series model to help visualize different components driving the prediction. It's a specialist tool for time series that helps visualize different components. So as you can see in this big blue square is the time period used for the training model, as I mentioned, 2016 to 2018. And the model decomposes the original data into fixed seasonal trends, as you can see on the right. Uh, the weekly, how is the trend looking? And then throughout the year, you can see it goes down in March, up in July, and so on and so forth. Um, the, if you click the next, and as you can see, this is our prediction to see what 2019 would look like based on the historical outputs as well as the trends in the model component. Um, next, please. And I believe, Callie, this is you. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> awesome, so thanks, Jessica. In addition to the time series models that Jessica mentioned, we also explored tree-based models. And tree-based tree -based techniques train across numerous combinations to return an optimized result. So as you can see here, we all know a basic decision tree um, this one, for example, is should I accept this job offer? These decision trees mirror human thinking and the hierarchy of decisions. But a question that we had during the use case, such as how many Levi's teas will we sell in our Asia region, region um, you can see it pictured here in the second tree, which is much, much more complex. And this, is, this tree is really just to show the level of complexity that the model can handle. But from that complexity, we can distill the graph that you see on the right. And this shows importance of the features that are used within our model. So here we can change very confusing complexity into profound simplicity. Specifically for our use case, we found that the most important features to our retail sales data were the major holidays in the region. We found that these were much more important to the forecast than even the total holidays. And to our surprise, Japan retail sales had more significance than China. Next slide, please. So MAPE, mean absolute percent error, 
is how we measure the success of the models. Um, it's a percentage error, like I mentioned, and that means that the lower percent equals better accuracy. So as Jessica mentioned, we tested three forecast models, and this was in order to predict 2019 sales. And the graph you see here plots the results for uh, Asia and Levi's. It's a little hard to see, so I apologize, um, but the purple dash that's going straight ac across the graph represents our MFP when it's planned manually because it's uh, forecasted without machine learning and it runs straight across because it's planned only at the season level. The black line or the dark solid line is the actual sales from 2019. And then those three dotted variations of the blue lines are the three forecast models. So there's really two main takeaways from this, and that's that all of the models that we tested captured similar seasonality to the actual sales. And the MFP, how it's planned manually only at the season, um, could actually be planned at lower levels, such as month, week, or even day with machine learning and deliver higher accuracy. Another learning was that accuracy is impacted by the level of the hierarchy. Um, and that's talking about our product hierarchy. So for example, at the highest level of just Asia retail um, is illustrated on the left, and then diving down into a specific country, in this example, China, illustrated on the right. And for each of these two umbrellas, we calculated MAPE, and it was the lowest at the brand level, so that highest level. And then it increased, which means worsened, as we drilled into the category and class levels. But this is expected because as you would imagine, it's easier to forecast at a higher level than it is at lower levels because they have much more nuance and intricacies. So while we're only show showcasing weekly MAPES, sorry, still on the last slide, uh, we're only showcasing, showcasing weekly MAPES here, once you zoom out to month or season, the accuracy improves greatly. And so the main takeaway is here is that one model, it does not always produce the best results. And that's the beauty of machine learning. We have a menu of models at our disposal and based on the testing that Jessica spoke to, we're able to extract the best prediction. Next slide, please. So as we've highlighted, a machine learning model can consider a much higher level of complexity than a human can. And this first image here on the side, you can see that once a model is designed, it can be copied and pasted and tuned at any level of our that our business would need to consider. So here we have our Asia region at the top, going down to channel, affiliate, sub-channel, all the way down to subclass. So these would be things like graphic tees. And as the next image shows, this would result in over 9,000 unique iterations, which is far too many for a human to be able to consider. But with machine learning, all of these iterations can be considered and consolidated into one MFP. Next slide, please. So by applying machine learning to our data, we can learn from very complex data sets, but synthesize them, excuse me, into meaningful and digestible outputs. But more importantly, we can apply these across our organization. This first example here of planning and inventory. So if we're able to improve our forecast accuracy, it will allow us to optimize how we invest in our inventory, which will maximize our sales. In supply chain, having this level of detailed advanced intelligence will help us to better negotiate with our vendors to improve our cost and profitability. Financially, more accurate unit predictions will drive more precise financial guidance. From the standpoint of product development, machine learning can help to optimize our assortment framework locally while driving global productivity. And finally, from the brand perspective, having this type of advanced detailed prediction will allow us to better plan and target marketing communications well in advance of product deployment at the local level. And the next slide, please. Here, if we're able to play it, is a little video, but if not, you can still see the code on the screen. Um, and this is just an example of all that went into the use case and the work that we did. But what we found that was the most significant was actually the added advantage of applying our own personal experience with LS & Co. We understand our business already, and this enables us to detect additional relationships in the data. 
it was really profound to see how the diverse experience within uh, the folks in the boot camp enabled us to spot the trends that lived outside of our models. And even more so, it became clear that we already have a data-driven team. We're a brand composed of extraordinary talent with very unique insights, and they can be directly applied to this data and AI decision-making. We have experiences and observations and a working knowledge of what drives our business. And I think I will stop there. We can see if there's any questions. And if there aren't any at this time, then I will pass it to Ron to introduce himself. I think I may jump in, um, Kelly and Jessica, on behalf of uh, shy, shy viewers. Um, quick question that we often ask our presenters. You guys both came from very different places and you do different things at Levi's. Um, was there a course that, or, or an aspect of what you studied that you wish you'd uh, taken more of when you were in college to prepare for what you do now? Statistics, definitely for me. <laughs> um, yeah, there were a few moments throughout the boot camp when I wish I had taken, well, I, I did take statistics, but it's just been a little while. So a refresher on that, I wish I had done. I actually agree with that comment. There was a, a piece of it where we're going through just what the instructors had said was simple statistics and it went above a lot of our heads. <laughs> As Callie mentioned, it's, it's been a while. Um, other than that, I think what the course really was for us, it was open to anyone and everyone. So you didn't have to have a base knowledge for Python or coding, but it would have been nice to have that base knowledge because we would have been able to learn even more and go a little faster like the other track, which Ron can probably speak to. So even just taking, you know, looking at YouTube or doing LinkedIn courses, you know, there's so much out there now that when we were younger or when I was going to school wasn't as available. So if you have free time, I would definitely recommend just, just YouTube or Google or LinkedIn. Got it. Um, it seems, Kelly, you are in a very different part of Levi's in terms of what you do in your day to day than Jessica is. And, and the use case was a very specific one with a very specific issue to solve for. So how do you take what you learned during the boot camp and contextualize it, Cali, to, you know, employee experience management um, and you, Jessica, in terms of, of, you know, your operations analysis, how do you, how do you just contextualize it for us in terms of what you learned and what that will now mean for you in your day to day? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I actually was one of three HR folks in the boot camp, so we're able to work as a team now, which is really great and beneficial, especially because to your point, we need to now take this work that was very retail focused and transition it to our people data. But I will say the process remains very similar. So um, digesting the data, doing you know exploratory data analysis on it, the code and the actual process for that is very similar. And especially having data that we're already familiar with and we understand, it's almost a little easier, I would say. Um, but the use cases themselves, and I think specifically when it comes to forecasting or predictions, that's something that we had to think a little bit about. Um, and it's really just been ideating with those other two folks, as well as some of our leaders to see you know, where are the issues that lie in the business currently? Let's start with that. And then how we, can we apply forecasting and predictions to that? And that's kind of where we came to those examples I mentioned of the seasonal hiring for our retail staff. So that's, I think, a prime example of where we can apply it. Great, that's super helpful. Jessica, what about you in terms of just the context of what you do at Levis in your day-to-day? -day? So uh, what I do is kind of a lot of consolidation of data and it's, been very manual. So what I've been working on with uh, one of our instructors who are currently our partners on our projects is to automate it. So instead of taking in, I think we have probably up to 20 different Excel files that we, some parts are automated, some are not, some are very manual. Um, instead of taking all those in, we're going to try and go straight to the source build up some code. As Callie mentioned, it's the same, the same code that she would use for if she was doing something similar. 
um, run it and then also create a front end or output that would enable users to easily select their, their region, their country, their, if it's retail or wholesale, so they can drill down and see, okay, I have this many units sold, I'm predicting this many in the future, how does that compare? And just to see, uh, do some investment review is, is what I do. So, and then I've been seeing there's been a bit more projects coming in and as new things come in and like I'm taking on a few other things, I'm like, oh, I know I can do this in Python. Oh, I can do this here. I can do that here. So just even the little things that you would do in Excel that would take maybe not too long, but still longer. If you put it in Python, we're going to do quick code and you can kind of repeat it more easily. So that's um, what goes into the day-to-day, -day. more just the small the small little things that you can add. Got it, that's super helpful guys. Thanks for sharing that. One question that I don't even understand, which is why I'm watching this with you guys is, is there a GitHub for this bootcamp? Do either of you know the answer to that? There is, I don't know if it's available to everyone. Um, my assumption is no. <laughs> that would be so we, we can we can check okay. and get back to you on that. Great, thanks, Jessica. I think yeah. now maybe we'll turn the next part of the presentation over to Ron. Alrighty, I'm ready whenever you guys are. Hi, so um, my name is Ronald Pretty Paul. I'm a coordinator on the men's denim design team. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, my background. So I am a first generation American. Both of my parents are from Ghana, which is a small little country in South America. Wonderful food. If you ever get to go to a Guyanese restaurant, highly recommend it. Um, growing up, I was always kind of really interested in math and science and I excelled pretty well in school. So um, I ended up actually being able to get into Stanford uh, University uh, where um, I wanted to study uh, aeronautics and um, like astrology. I wanted to be an astronaut one day and uh, someone uh, pointed out that if I have asthma and uh, glasses that I probably will not be an astronaut. So uh, I thought about what the next thing in my life that I like more than space and it was denim. Uh, I'm a huge denim head and so now it's really awesome that I am on a design team uh, that works on the oldest pair of jeans and the most iconic denim jacket in the world. It's one of the oldest design teams in the world, which is just so awesome. So it's it's just truly, I'm truly grateful to be here at Levi's now. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so truly grateful to be here. Um, so just kind of like a little bit about my story and how I got into machine learning. Um, as I kind of talked about before, I was super into um, uh, like aeronautics and mechanical engineering in college, but um, on top of like the kind of physical things of not being able to be an astronaut, which I know is every kid's dream, uh, I struggled a lot with math, science and computer science in school. I think going to such a um, rigorous college uh, and coming from like a bit of a lower income background and not having as much resources in college, I was kind of dissuaded from the fields of like computer science, data science, or STEM in general. Um, I'm a lifelong denim lover though, and on the left you can see that's my first and only tattoo that I have. It's the stitching of selvage jeans on my ankle, uh, just so that I always have a pair of jeans on me, even when I don't. Um, so uh, kind of leaning into that like tattoo and that passion, I decided to major in history uh, and I studied the history of denim production. And I did my thesis on denim production uh, in the United States and Italy in the 20th century. And uh, it was always kind of like a question of like, what are you gonna do with a degree in the history of denim? Um, and I kind of didn't know myself. I just knew I was passionate about it. Uh, so after I graduated, I, applied for every single job I could at Levi's and then I also emailed every Levi email address I could find on the internet uh, whether it's in my alumni database or just public information and it's just like I love denim please hire me uh, so I eventually got hired as a temp uh, working for the merchandising team 
And uh, even though I didn't study design in school, uh, I think that the design team saw the passion I had for denim. And I was eventually recruited to be a coordinator on the design team and get to work on some of my most favorite projects, uh, products. Uh, when I saw that we had a machine learning bootcamp, I signed up for it because they said you didn't need any kind of skill or background. Uh, and even though I had a little bit of a background in kind of statistics and stuff, uh, I was like, this might be an opportunity to study something that in the past I thought wasn't for me or thought I wasn't like good enough to do. And uh, so I took the machine learning bootcamp and on the right right here is actually one of the projects that I worked on in the bootcamp, which uh, was a creative project that was a little bit of a side project from our use case, um, but it's since gone a lot bigger, uh, that transfers paintings into jackets uh, and makes really beautiful art. Um, I'm a very creative person, so I always wanted to know, I always knew going into the boot camp, I wanted to apply it for a more creative field. If you could go to the next slide. So in the uh, advanced class, uh, um, the, sorry, the previous slide before, yeah. Uh, in the advanced class, our initial project was to um, study email marketing campaigns and in doing that, we use neural networks to kind of figure out what um, are the kind of emails that our, our customers are engaging with in their inboxes using a lot of data that we um, have based on email campaigns we've done in the past. But one thing that's really crazy about neural networks is that they essentially model the way a human brain works. And so when you take a neural network that's been trained on one task and you apply it to another, it actually gets pretty good. This is something called transfer learning. And so using some of the um, skills I learned from um, building neural networks for email tracking, I decided to apply it for my design role. So if we could go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, okay. So um, a little bit about denim design. It's a little different than many other forms of design uh, that you do in the industry. Uh, for us, what we do is we scour the world um, looking for vintage jeans, and we basically um, make our own comments on them on like how we want them to change. And we send them to a vendor to see if they can execute and they can capture our vision. Uh, it's a very manual process. We do it all by hand with tape and handwritten notes and, and pictures and drawing directly on jeans. It's, it's a really manual process. Um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we weren't able to travel around the world and find beautiful jeans to um, inspire us for our designs. So I wanted to take the neural network model that I had learned about in the machine learning bootcamp and apply it to kind of solve this problem, the problem that we can't travel to find jeans that are beautiful. So what I did is I created a model that can actually transfer the finishing and the color of one gene onto the pattern of another. And so what you see here is the two genes on the left are actual photographs of genes that we have already had in our archives that we've captured either from buying vintage or genes that we've made. And the gene on the right is a computer generated image that uh, is a amalgamation of the two. And this is really awesome as a designer to get inspiration from what we already have in ways that, you know, we couldn't in the past without machine learning. If you wanna to go to the next slide, um, I can show you. So this model is really robust and it can apply finishing from a whole host of genes and really create these really realistic looking images that can inspire us and kind of give us direction for how we want to design into a season. Um, and uh, so this right here is this like pink and blue over dyed gene, which I always loved the texture and the color of, but I always wanted to see it on different patterns. And using machine learning, uh, I was able to see what it might look like if we applied this finish to another pair of jeans. And that's really awesome to me as, as a designer. Uh, next slide. And yeah, just to further showcase the robustness of this, this neural network, you know, we can go from black jeans to blue jeans while still maintaining kind of the overall aesthetic of the first pair of jeans, but really kind of reimagining how that might look on another fabric or in another color. Uh, so it's just really awesome technology. And it's, it's crazy how quick um, technology is moving in the space of computer vision. So let's go to the next slide. 
so right here is kind of a model of the system that I was telling you guys about, a neural network. What neural networks do is they mimic the brain by introducing multiple layers of what we call neurons, kind of similar to the neurons in our, on our head. As we pass in images to the neurons, um, it will fire off different connections through the neural network based off of um, like what the image is tagged as, if it's tagged as um, like a face or not. In this uh, like demonstration, this is a neural network that's been trained on faces. In the earlier layers of the model, it's really only picking up very small details, things like the shape of your, like, you know, like a, a line or a, a circle or something like that. But as you get through the model, the, the neural network starts to pick up more and more features. In like the middle layers, you can see it's capturing eyes and noses and ears. And then in the final layers, it's actually capturing whole faces. Um, this is a neural network that was trained to classify faces into like different genders and races. Um, but the same basic concept goes for any neural network. And this goes for images, audio, data, like we did for our email marketing campaigns. It starts to pick up on patterns. And what's really awesome is that um, a neural network can pick up on really complex patterns that a human being just simply would not be able to, to, to get, or that would take a human being many, many years to, to learn. To showcase this, uh, if we can move to the next slide, Taking that same neural network that I used to make um, those genes that I showed earlier, I decided to see what would happen if I passed in famous art paintings. Um, I'm a huge like art history buff or geek. I always loved those classes in, in college. And one thing that was really crazy to me is how beautiful and abstract the, the outputs of these images are. Um, I, uh, love denim, I love art, but you know, I wouldn't have thought to ever make a jacket like this based off of Starry Night. Um, it's just kind of really cool how it can take the style of uh, a painter, um, kind of something that would be captured in the earlier layers of a neural network and then apply it to the hard details of um, a jacket, which would be captured later. Actually, sorry, that's a little mixed up. The jacket, details will be captured earlier in the neural network and the style gets captured later. And so when you create these merges, it's really inspiring as a designer to kind of be able to recontextualize paintings, anything in the world to get inspiration and to broaden it from just like the clothes that we normally think of. If you wanna to move to the next slide, I can um, kind of showcase some of the other stuff. Um, I really think this is a beautiful application of neural style transfer. Jasper Johns is a great painter and I love um, this piece called Corpse and Mirror 2. And I really love how um, the lines and the red and blue got applied to just the hard like kind of lines of our iconic trucker jacket. And, and just, it's just, these are really beautiful, awesome things. Um, next, next slide. Yeah, and uh, also a big David Hockney fan and just um, like, just another really cool inspirational piece that I think just really awesome to see uh, how, you know, a computer might do design and hopefully I'm not out of a job in five years, but uh, you know, I think it's really awesome that computers can have this sort of creativity and, and really assist us in the design process and assist us in ideating in, in really automatic and, and revolutionary ways. Um, so next slide. Um, so I kind of wanted to just talk about maybe a use case that's very direct for our company and something that I've been using a neural network for that um, is just really cool. And one thing as a designer that we spend a ton of time doing in a season is color matching threads to Pantones. We get threads and fabrics from all over the world and they're often in different color spaces and, um, you know, like, all kind of all over the place. And we want to find like, what's the best thread for a fabric? Uh, using neural networks, we were able to calculate um, differences in colors based on spectrometry data. And a process that used to take us 30 minutes to 45 minutes per color now takes us a couple seconds. We just 
put in the uh, the codes and pull up the spectrometry data. And I mean, I don't know if you guys can even see on your screen because of the compression, but uh, that is a, there's a thread right there on the book that's just blending right into the the fabric. And you know, there's so many uses for machine learning that um, go beyond just hard data science and almost any kind of small task, even stuff that's outside of the computer, something that you manually have to do by hand, neural networks and machine learning can really speed up um, the ways of working. And so one thing I really challenge a lot of um, you students who are listening is to think about things in your life or things in your jobs if you're um, going into the workforce that are manual and, you know, take a lot of time and, and think about like ways that that can be automated, even if it uh, seems outlandish. Uh, yeah. And uh, I guess next slide, uh, this is just a Q and A slide, but um, I remember earlier in the other Q and A, there was kind of talks about, you know, how to get into this and just some resources I'd like to give out to people watching at home are, um, uh, I learned Python through this free website called Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. Great resource, lots of tutorials and videos on how to use Python from a beginner standpoint. Um, you can take the course in about two weeks. It's 100% free and it's, uh, it's a great introduction to Python. If you're interested in the more creative side of machine learning and neural networks and artificial intelligence, a free program that I'd recommend is called Runway ML. Um, it does a lot of the stuff that I was able to do with uh, my neural network with creating artistic style transferred images, uh, but it does it in a user interface that's very welcoming. You don't need any coding experience. And there's lots of tutorials out there too, if you want to explore using neural networks and machine learning to create art and design. Thanks, Ron. You know, a couple of questions have popped up and I have one or two for you as well. So um, a very specific one, when using the neural nets to overlay the paintings onto the denim pieces, what were the objective functions and or success metrics used to identify a good model? Yeah, so the objective functions and, and success metrics are based off of the idea that different layers of the neural network capture different features of um, uh, image or any kind of data, but an image in this case. And so the earlier layers of a neural network we'll be able to capture hard lines and contours of images. Uh, and so that's, we have two kind of uh, loss functions or, or success functions. One is like, how much is our final image hitting those lines and those hard kind of contours of the image? And so that's telling us how similar is this to um, a jacket that we have in, that we're feeding in. And then the other one is gonna be capturing like further on the neural network, capturing the style of a painting or paint or, uh, artist. And that will kind of, um, we have another function that's like, will that output image kind of um, be successful in the last couple stages of the neural network? And so those two loss functions, you can weight them in different ways. And some of them create more abstract pieces, some of them create more con um, concrete. And that's kind of like the role of me as a designer to like weigh things out and to, to massage the neural network, but those are the objective loss functions that create um, the, the imagery. Got it. So, cause this, this ties into another question, which I think you touched on, is the neural network making the recommendations for these design variations independently? Are you guiding it? What's the tension between the neural network and you and your own choices? This is kind of something that kind of goes into the ethics of neural networks and kind of the um, kind of human experience. Um, fashion is a very human experience. It's the way we dress our bodies, which is so intimate. Uh, it's also the way we communicate with others. And so I have a lot of reservations about using a neural network to completely replace the role of a designer. And so while I could create a neural network that does a lot more of the kind of stuff of recommending what styles to kind of create for a season. I think there's ways to do that. I think it loses the fundamental reason why a lot of us go into fashion. And um, so it's kind of a long-winded answer, but it can do that. But as kind of data stewards and, and machine learning people with such power, we need to kind of always think about 
how our product is being used. And so I personally use it as a tool that helps me create designs. Um, and I think it's something really important to think about when making neural networks, you know, we don't necessarily know exactly all the decisions they're making. And so it's really important for us to still have that human touch in there. Got it. So maybe just take that a little further because I'm going to ask you what I asked um, Kelly and Jessica about just the context of what you learned during boot camp and how you're going to apply it in your Levi's day to day. And, you know, I love what you showed us, um, you know, the Jasper Johns and the Hockney, those are beautiful pieces. But so how how are you going to take what you learned, Ron, and, and, and leverage that experience in your day to day? Um, so th there's a couple ways already. The thread matching is something that I've done in the past uh, week, actually. And that's that's a very objective kind of like uh, very easy thing that I have to do. I have to spend a ton of time in the office and um, that's like uh, using kind of Python and, and algorithms to automate that part process is, is um, just like one of the big things. But uh, for me, it's going to be kind of like these like larger kind of um, conceptual things. It's when we go into concept, I want to be able to create lots of concept imagery really quickly and see what speaks to me. And, I think that's going to be kind of like something really important um, just like for me, like to, to be able to like get a lot of concept imagery and, and just see what speaks to me. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, guys, this is so interesting. I think to all of the viewers, you, you know, you all went or experienced the same boot camp, but you're taking that learning to such different places at Levi's. It's really, really interesting. One question for any of the three of you that came in. When did it become such an important, uh, you know, and prevalent uh, commitment that Levi's has? And are there other companies doing this? Is this unique to Levi's? What, you know, how long has machine learning been around? Just maybe a little bit of background. I think we might have lost Ron. I can try <laughs> Sorry, and take I... this one. <laughs> um, I don't know the how the age of our data science team. I would say it's definitely within the last five years, though, for sure. Jessica, I don't know if you know exactly. Um, but recently, as a company, we've embarked on this journey to like transform our company into a digital and data and AI powered business, because we know that that's what's needed to take us into the future. And I would say that those discussions more broadly, anyway, have been happening over the last year. Um, and the boot camp is kind of a result of that, I would say. So, um, in order to get our organization to that level or continue to upskill our employees, they wanted to offer opportunities like the boot camp, as well as some other opportunities actually that are a little less intensive, I would say, to upskill employees. Um, but the overall idea is to get us all upskilled so that we can speak the same language and be on the same page and, you know, take the company into that the future. <laughs> Got it. And I think you guys touched on it. Um, I know you did, Kelly and Jessica. When we you talk about this and, and how it's going to drive profitability, like how do you see it in its ultimate expression and accomplishing that or achieving that? Because it's felt a little bit in some contexts abstract now, but so how do you see it in its ultimate application driving profitability from your three different perspectives? So for me, I think kind of one of the things I'm really excited about is um, using neural networks to predict how a gene might come from a vendor before we even send it out. Uh, so sometimes we do actually send two genes to a vendor and be like, remix these two genes. Like we, we do that manually and if we have a way of visualizing how that looks before we even send to the vendor and we decide this doesn't look that great, let's send a different gene instead, or like, let's you know use this other kind of color instead of like uh, the one that we're gonna send, uh, that can save us time because it takes time to ship to the vendor, it takes time for them to, to execute in the factory and it takes time to ship back. So if you can get an idea of the general sense of what something might look like, that will save us time and time is money, you know, so get us to the market faster with our finished development and, and speed up our finished development. Uh, that makes sense. What about you, Jessica or Kelly, in terms of what you do? I agree with the time aspect that, that Ron mentioned. As I said, a lot of our processes are currently extremely manual. So a lot of the time, some of our colleagues are using their time to just clean the data and make sure it looks all right before they do the analysis. 
And so then there's not as much time to analyze the data and, and come up with the best solution. So by condensing the time for the cleanup and that like pre-processing, which honestly is a lot of what we have been told machine learning is, is making sure your data is clean first before you can actually even do any of these modelings, uh, our predictive analysis. Um, will definitely increase our, our profit. So then everybody can focus on making the right products, getting the right costing, getting the right marketing, sending the right emails. So all of that combined will um, reduce our costs and, and, and increase our revenue. Yeah. Thanks. I think mine's a little bit different um, just because it's not so much of automation, but more so uncovering you know, how can we uh, enable a more diverse employee base, which we know impacts the bottom line just in and of itself. Um, and then also people analytics is very new at Levi's, it will say, so we have so much opportunity, but something like uh, predicting the seasonal hiring, like I mentioned, that is not a very specific process currently. So if we, that can be more pinpointed then we aren't over hiring and losing money on paying employees that we don't necessarily need to fill the void there or the opposite, right? If we don't have enough staff and they're not able to serve our, our customers during that time, we might miss sales. So those are a couple impacts. And then being able to uh, uh, predict attrition or turnover of employees, I think there's a statistic, I'm not 100% on it, but I want to say it's between 20 and 30%. Um, it costs that much more to hire a new employee than it does to retain your current employee and um, hopefully upskill them. So that's just another impact to the bottom line that uh, we may be able to facilitate. Yeah, that's great. I love three very different answers, but really helpful, again, to contextualize this. One specific question, guys, that came in from Bonnie, can FIT be measured or learned? Do you see that driving new styles and projections? Um, yeah, so I'll take this one. I, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yes, you kinda, <laughs> yeah. um, yes uh, there are some really interesting um, kind of applications of, of uh, machine learning for fit. And um, oh man, I think it's called 3D scan. There's an iPhone app now that creates body scans um, of you just by you put your iPhone down and you spin around in front of it. And uh, I know that some people in the fashion industry have been using that to um, create new fits and create custom fitted jeans. And so I definitely see that as like a new frontier in fit development, just kind of learning body shapes of our consumers on like a very real level so that we can create the best jeans and the best clothing that fits uh, our consumers' bodies. Um, and so, yeah, definitely think fit, um, measuring fit and using machine learning have really great impacts for fit development. Great. Thanks for that, Ron. You know, guys, I think that is about enough time for this session in terms of our need to wrap it up. But as I mentioned, this is taped. And so we're going to be able to make this available to all the students that weren't able to watch. Um, that was great. I learned a lot, <laughs> a whole lot. I saw my first um, selvage stitch tattoo. Thank you for that, Ron. <laughs> Seriously, thank you all. It was really, really helpful and thoughtful and provocative. Um, anybody who tuned in, please tune back in next week for our next session. Uh, it will be on adaptive clothing, ensuring an inclusive future. Thank you, Ron. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, Kelly. Um, and good night. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Bye. Guys. Bye.